good song. Of course, you know, Jesus talked about my family. Go teach all them nations, you know. They really needed some help. Still do. <laughs> but you know, um, before service has started, um, Michael came to me and said, you know, what's your subject? And, you know, I want to tell Jack, Zach so he can pick out some songs that goes along with the lesson. And I told him, you know, womanhood, motherhood, that's, you know, that's it. I'm going to talk about that tonight. So he picked up these songs and he picked out 89 and I opened the song book up and my eyes didn't focus on that first line. It, my eyes focused on Tempestuous sea, unknown ways, boisterous waves, and treacherous shoal? Zach, you in trouble. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, you know, but then I see where it was coming from in verse 2. And the mother steals her child. That's, uh, that's good because it's important to have a good mother. We talked about having a good father last night. And having a good mother is very important. You know, those saying the the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And there's so much truth in that. We also talked about how that, you know, even if we don't have good family, there's replacements in the house of the Lord. And that maybe we need to step up and be that replacement surrogate father, brother, sister, and yes, mother. We spoke about how that Paul looked upon Timothy as his son in the faith. We don't know much about um, Timothy's dad other than he was a Greek. But his mother was Jewish. And we read in 2 Timothy chapter 1, as we continue what Paul said, he said in verse 5, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that is in thee also. Paul gives credit to Timothy's mother and grandmother for being the force in his life that, yes, instilled faith within him. True faith, not pretended faith. And thus, a mother and a grandmother can have a powerful influence upon their children. And if you think about Timothy, Timothy is one of the most prominent individuals in the New Testament. And his companionship with Paul and his work and his travels and his preaching and his teaching, as a matter of fact, there's two books in the New Testament with his name on it. First and Second Timothy. And this is some man. This is a man that had a good beginning. He had a good course and a good ending. But Paul's giving credit to his mom, his grandmom. You know, as I went up to Kentucky, I, I ran into some different folks who had a lot of different ideas about the role of women. And, and truly, we all have different roles to play. It's important for us to play the roles that God gave us, to fulfill the roles that God gave us. And, you know, I... I spoke with some folks that just simply didn't believe that women were capable of, of teaching anything, anybody, anywhere, anything. I think that's a direct quote. I thought, wow, where did that come from? Because I don't read that in the Bible. I, I read passages like Titus chapter 2 and verse 3 where it says the aged women... Likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. There's a role for women in the church to be teachers, teachers of young women. Now, that takes the young women being willing to be taught. And it takes the older women to be willing to teach. Now the naysayer that I was speaking of earlier would say, well, they do that by example. They, should, they do that by example. 
You know, the older woman who is the most qualified to impart and teach important lessons to young women would have already had the experience of life of raising their family, of raising their children. Now you tell me how she's going to be teaching by example. How is she to teach the young women to love their husbands when she may be a widow woman who might be the most qualified to impart the lessons of how to have a spiritual home and, a, and be the type of wife that she ought to be? That's just not what this says. And so whenever we consider the subject of godly women in the New Testament, there, there's not a lot of information. But just these few verses speaks volumes of what a godly woman ought to be. And so I'm thinking, well now, who perhaps might have been the first Righteous woman mentioned in the New Testament. Did you ever think about that? I want us to go over to Luke chapter 1. Because that woman was a, a woman named Elizabeth in Luke chapter 1. And Elizabeth had a very important role to play. Now, as she had gotten older and desperately wanted a child but didn't have a child. We know that they were praying for a child. And her husband was one of the priests of God, a man by the name of Zacharias. And in Luke chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, There was in the days of Herod, king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. That's a powerful verse. If, if any one of us, if it could be said by the Lord that we were righteous before God, that we walked in the commandments and ordinance of the, of the Lord and were blameless, what a compliment. And both Zacharias and Elizabeth were given that compliment. Verse 7, they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. And the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. May take a while. May take a while for God's will to be revealed. But God heard your prayer. Your prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, and he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. I mean, this man that is to be born, their son, their child, will be great in God's sight. And he will be fulfilling a mighty mission. Verse 24. In verse 24, after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, and of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Now you've got two women here. Elizabeth 
Commentary's already been made. She's a righteous woman. Their prayer was heard. She's going to have a son. I'm going to cut to the end of the story and let you know this is John. Their child is John, who is called the Baptist, the Immerser. He wasn't called that until he began his ministry. He was John, the son of Zacharias and Elizabeth. And he was kin folks with Jesus. He was a cousin. Their mothers were cousins. And we know that John was to prepare the way of the Lord. And he did. He prepared the people to receive Jesus and the message of the coming kingdom. And we know that one of the verses that I remember that John said in John 1.29 is when he pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus is God's Lamb. And he came to this earth to take away my sin. John prepared that way. And he did a good job. We know the character of Elizabeth. We know the character of Mary. For Mary was specifically chosen to be the mother of the Lord. And can you re- imagine young Mary being there and, and an angel appearing before you? That must have been a, a, an unsettling sight. And that's why Mary was given assurance, fear not, Mary, fear not, for you found favor with God. And behold, verse 31, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And then said Mary, Unto the angel, how shall this be seen? I know not a man. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. When we read these stories, this ought to build our faith because God is still God and He still rules above. And I don't know how many years Zacharias and Elizabeth prayed for that child. That child came. Well, they're too old to have a child. With God, nothing should be impossible. And then young Mary... Here she is, espoused unto Joseph. But yet they had not come together. They had not lived together. And now she's told, you're going to conceive a child? What confusion. But yet Mary's faith shines through in verse 38. For Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. So, Mary's been informed that your cousin Elizabeth, it's the sixth month with her. And if you do your math right, in about three months, she's going to have a child. Mary, you have now conceived. What did she do? She arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste unto a city of Judea and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. Look at verse 41. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ear, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed. And there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Mary came to Elizabeth, saluted her, greeted her. She says the babe leapt in her womb. The what? The babe. What was it? 
It was a babe. Oh, I thought it was a, a fetus. <laughs> See, we change these words, don't we? In order to sort of, you know, kind of soothe our conscience. Because it sounds better to kill a fetus. But it doesn't sound very nice to kill a babe. Six months this child had grown within Elizabeth. And at six months, this unborn child is called a babe. And it says that the babe leapt in her womb for joy. Do you know we slaughter unborn six months old every day of the year in the United States of America? At one time, they, the so-called lobby convinced people, well, that's not really a child. It's not really a child. Then they invented ultrasound. And you can see the child. You can see the features of the child. Didn't even have to go that far because even the medical professionals say that as they rip and tear the unborn child, from the mother, they reassemble the parts to make sure they got it all. We will be judged for the morality that we have or the immorality that we have. And abortion, its industry, is at the heart of immorality. Now, you know, you would, in today's time, advise Elizabeth to kill that unborn child, wouldn't you? I'm talking about society. You're too old. You're too old to have a child. You can't care for that child. You're already well advanced in, the, in years. We need to schedule you for a procedure. They're told that every day. And to Mary, well, you know, that's not your husband's child. The ramifications of that is, is going to be terrible for you, Mary. And you're awfully young. We need to schedule you for a procedure. And according to the popular notions of our society today, John and Jesus both would not have been born. We need to face the truth on these issues. But yet this is God's hand. God's work. And Mary said in verse 46, My soul doth magnify the Lord. She was praising the Lord. She wasn't ashamed. She wasn't cowardly. She said, My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For He hath regarded the lowest state of His handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. And I believe everybody here right now in our hearts, we're saying, blessed be Mary. For she submitted to the will of God and the Savior was born into this world so that I could have hope of heaven someday. Blessed be you, Mary. Mary said, For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. God looks upon us. And says you're important. He has lifted up those of low degree. He has brought down those that are mighty. Because in the Lord we are equal. Maybe you're blind or diseased or you have physical ailments. Maybe you're infirmed. Perhaps you don't think that you're as intelligent as other people. 
Maybe you, you don't prosper like others do. And maybe you have struggles in life. But from the very conception of Jesus, the promise was made that this Lord, this Jesus, will lift you up and bring you up because you are important. You are valuable in the sight of God. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath hoped or helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Jesus is the fulfillment of those promises of old. He is the one that was promised to come. And Mary abode with her about three months. And that's at the time of the birth of John. At the time of the birth of John, then she returned to her own house. And that child was born. Now, when we consider that Mary returned home and now she is expecting a child, and it might be easy to hide that fact in the first week, second week, third week, fourth week, sixth week, eighth week, two months, but when you get to the third month, it's going to be pretty obvious most of the time. So here she returns. Matthew chapter 1. She's got a husband. Now they haven't come together. But she's got a husband. And what's her husband going to do? What's he going to think? What's he going to say? For his espoused wife is expecting a child and he knows it's not his. Matthew 1 and verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with the child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a, a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph... Thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Mary's return. Joseph's in confusion. He doesn't know what to do. He knows what the old law says, that you're supposed to take her and stone her to death. But he was minded. He, he said, well... I may just need to put her away in a private fashion and not make her the public example of stoning. And I think the overriding idea is Joseph just didn't know what to think because he knew Mary and he knew her character and he knew that this was not a part of her character for her to be an adulteress. Now, when you read in the Bible about espousal, espousal is a marriage. It's a binding legal agreement before the two set up household together. And it lasts a period of time. But it is a marriage. It is a legal binding covenant. And if, even if you consider the idea that the angel said, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife... And if she hadn't been his wife, she w he wouldn't have had to put her away anyhow. So please do not equate the concept of espousal in the Bible with the idea of, of engagement in American society. To get engaged shows an intention with a trial period that may or may not work out. 
and frequently it does not work out. But that's not a binding legal agreement. And that's still your girlfriend, that's still your boyfriend, even if you are engaged. Until you say, I do. And now, similar to that would be if, if two people got married and uh, they had the, the ceremony, it was legal, it was before witnesses, it was an acknowledgement of the laws of our land, and the couple goes off to uh, their honeymoon, and before they arrive at their destination, tragedy occurs, and one of them is killed. Were they ever married? Of course they were married. Yes, they were married. They had entered into a binding legal agreement. And that's what we find here with Mary and Joseph. The angel relieved his anxiety and told him what was going on. And so therefore, this son that would be born will be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. And Jesus truly was God with us. For even though he's the son of man because he was born of Mary. And he was the son of God in the sense that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. The miracle. He's God the son. He's the word. John 1.1. 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. That word is Jesus. And, and he is God. He's God the Son. He's not, he's not God the Father. He's not God the Holy Spirit. But He is God the Son. You know, the reason I bring some of this up is because people like to play games. And we're not going to play games with God. There are folks, especially in the older population, so, you know, this issue is not just for younger people. There are older people who kind of say, well, you know, if, if, if we get married, I, I, I'll lose $300 on my check. So, so let's just live together and pretend like we're married. Do you know how often that happens? It happens a lot. And then there's young people who says, you know, temptation is so great, and I want to, I want to fornicate. So, hey, girlfriend, boyfriend. Why don't we just sort of have a, oh, I'm, I'm loyal to you and you're loyal to me and we're just kind of like we're married. And that somehow they think gives them permission to sin. We play games with each other. You ain't going to play games with God. You don't think these things happen? I know they've happened. I've talked to folks that it happened too. And you want to talk about stress, distress, anxiety, regrets? Yeah, it sets in. God tells you what to do. You are to remain pure until you decide that you're going to be married. And sexual activity is within the bonds of marriage. And outside of that, it's called fornication. And fornicators shall not inherit the kingdom of God, according to the scriptures. You say, well, that's, that's awfully tough. Yeah, it's, it's tough. Being a sinner is tough. You think it's tough to live a, a righteous life. It's tough to live a sinful life. And the burden of sin is so great that it will weigh you down and crush you. I'm thankful for the godly women who will stand up for the truth and say, no, I'm not going to engage in this activity until I am married. You know, since this is about women, I'm thankful for men who say the same thing. I'm thankful that there was an Elizabeth. And I'm grateful that there was a Mary to be there. Luke chapter 2, in the book of Luke in chapter 2, verse, verse 1, there was a tax that was ordered by Caesar, Caesar Augustus. 
And everybody was supposed to go to their own city to be taxed. And since Joseph was a descendant of David, he went to the town of Bethlehem in order to be registered for the taxation. In verse 5 it says he was to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. It's time to have a child. And so it was that while they were there, the, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered and she brought forth her Firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. It's time to have a baby. The baby's about due. Nine months. Great with child. Mary, come on. I don't know. We got a walk, or maybe they had a donkey that she rode on. I don't know. Come on, let's go. What? You expect me in my condition? Nine months along, but to have a baby any day to go with you to Bethlehem? In the words of Sharon, my wife, are you out of your mind? <laughs> you see, but what does it say about Mary? I've got faith. It's going to be okay. All right, all right, let's make the journey. Oh, it's time for the baby to be born, the Lord. Well, let's go in here to the, uh, to the hotel with nice, crisp linen sheets. <laughs> you know, they did have linen in those days. Uh, no, sorry, there's no room. There's no room in the inn. Well, what are we going to do? We can't stay out here on the street. Well, there, there's the stable. A stable? My baby is going to be born in a stable? Yeah, that's right. You, you don't read about the complaints of Mary. Mary accepted it. She had faith. And she knew that it was going to be okay. Now, I see a lot of mommies here. And, you know, your firstborn child... You go see your firstborn child, and mommy says, Whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. Go wash your hands. <laughs> go wash your hands. Now, sterilize them, put, put this. Now put gloves on. Now, now here, raise your hands. We're going to put a, a surgical gown on you. Make sure you got a cap and goggles. Okay, you can hold my baby a little bit. <laughs> Isn't that the way it is? And then you go and well, let's go get the bottle and give the kid the bottle, you know. The firstborn child, you know what I'm saying. Uh, is that sterilized? Did you boil that for five minutes before you put it together? You know, that's the first child. Third child, it's on the floor. There's dirt on it. Ah, it'd be all right. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the way. I don't, how many of you are the middle child? You know, how, how many of you are the third child, you know? The first child, picture, 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 picture. You know, second child, picture, 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 picture. Third child, where's my pictures, mama? <laughs> they don't get me to that third child. I think there's one of me as a baby. I'm third child. <laughs> people are people. Mary was a mother. She was a first-time mother. And she had to give birth in a stable. And she had to put that precious little new baby boy in a, in a feeding trough where the animals eat. You see that? Why would she agree to do that? Why would she agree to do that without complaining and murmuring? Because she had faith. That's why. Because when you have faith of the right kind, it will carry you through whatever trials, tribulations you face. And you're going to be okay. It will be alright. Whatever it is. I, I will say this. How many, how many times have you heard people say, Jesus was born in a manger. Hey, have you ever heard that? <laughs> it's really kind of funny. Uh, yeah, Jesus was born in a manger. No, He was not born in a manger. He was born in a stable and laid in a manger. Okay, he wasn't born in the manger. So, I've heard people say that so much. He's born in the manger. Uh, 
But anyway, God is going to make sure that this child, this son of God, is going to have humble beginnings. And let me tell you, there's no more humble begin, more humble beginnings than what we're reading right now. And I don't care who you are or where you were born or under what circumstances. You weren't born under worse circumstances than these. But God did not leave us without testimony. For there were abiding in the same country shepherds in the field. Verse 8. Keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. For unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying concerning that which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. The Savior is born. God did not allow this night to go past without the miraculous. The angel of the Lord appearing to tell the witnesses to go and view and behold. And the heavenly host appearing before them, glorifying and praising God. What a wonderful scene this was. And thus you have witness after witness amongst the shepherds that would be able to tell that this event truly happened. It came time for them to appear into the temple and pay according to the law of Moses. And they brought a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. The Old Testament tells us that they were supposed to bring a lamb to offer and sacrifice. But if you were too poor, and couldn't afford a lamb, then you brought the two turtle doves and the two young pigeons. Mary and Joseph were poor. God would provide for them because you know later there would be wise men. We don't know how many. There would be wise men come to bring gifts Wonderful gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And when King Herod heard from the wise men about this new king being born, he inquired, well, where, where, where is this child going to be born? Bethlehem. Because the wise men did not heed the words of King Herod and they returned home a different way and did not go back and make a report to Herod, Herod sent forth the news to kill all the babies. To kill the babies of Bethlehem. And he did from two years and under. But being warned of God, Mary and Joseph escaped. And they went down into Egypt until Herod was dead. And then they went back to Nazareth where Jesus grew up. How'd they afford that? How'd they afford to make that trip and survive in a foreign land with a newborn baby, a little baby? Because God provided. And unexpectedly they had gold, frankincense, and myrrh.
at the dedication, we find that there was a man named Simeon. Simeon was a man, chapter Luke 2, verse 25, that the Bible says he was a just and a devout man waiting for the consolation of Israel. It says the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it was revealed unto him that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, the Messiah. So he came in the Spirit into the temple. When the parents brought in the child Jesus, and Simeon took the child from their arms, he took them up in his arms and blessed God and made this statement. Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace. According to thy word, for my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Simeon said some interesting things here. That this child would be a lot to the Gentiles. Yes, he is. Now maybe we have some individuals here of Jewish background, I don't know. But we probably mainly are Gentiles, non-Jewish people. And Jesus came to be the Savior of the Gentiles as well as of the Jews who would believe. He was set for the fall and rising of many in Israel. But there was a statement that Simeon made to Mary. Mary, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. A sword will pierce Mary's soul? The righteous woman, the handmaiden of the Lord? The woman full of faith and dedication? And the answer is yes. Even that person, that woman, that individual of great character and faith will have a sword pierce her soul. And that's exactly what happened. Because Mary was even there at the scene of the cross when they took her son After having scourged him and beat him and bruised him, mocked him, spat upon him, plaited a crown of thorns and placed upon his brow. And as he was forced to carry on his own cross until he could carry no more, Mary was there. Mary witnessed his son, her son in that condition. She didn't try to save his life by lying and saying his claims were false. She could have tried to discredit him in order to save his life, but she couldn't because the truth was the truth. And so as she witnessed Jesus being stripped of his clothing and the nails put through his hands and through his feet, she stood there and watched. And there is nothing that a mother could have done that was any more difficult than that. And thus throughout the ages, the example of Mary is with us. Blessed art thou, Mary. Is Jesus your Savior? Have you submitted your life to Him? We know that He came to be your Savior. But it's up to you. Express the faith that it takes in order to obey the heat of the gospel, the word of the gospel. Change your life and determine that even though you may have sinned and fallen in the past, you're determined to live for God now. Confess his name. Be baptized to wash away your sins. Let's stand and sing the song selected.